Hello, and welcome to The Dungeon. I'm your host, Rob. In today's video, we're going to be taking a look at the Undead Warlock from Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft. So this one is technically setting specific, but I was going to look at like the Undying, but honestly, it's one of the weakest choices there is, and I think that now that we have the Undead, a lot of people just prefer to play that one if it's available. So we'll look at it, because in my opinion, it's quite a bit better. Um, and I think it has, you know, some really cool aspects of the subclass, which I really like a lot. So I'd rather talk about something, you know, positive instead of just complaining about the Sword Coast Adventures Guide forever. Which we could do, of course, but I think it gets repetitive, you know, so. So let's start out, we'll take a look at the spell list. Uh, as always, remember that Warlock spells for your subclass are not automatically added to your character, it's just extra ones that you could choose to spend your, you know, spells no one selections on instead. Um, also remember that if you're going straight Warlock, there could be scaling issues. So that is something that we will talk about. So at level one, we get Bane and False Life. Bane is a pretty decent debuff. Uh, you know, anytime you mention Bane, it's pretty hard not to compare it to Bless, which is generally better. But that doesn't mean that Bane itself is necessarily a bad spell. And it does have some scaling. I don't think it's a terrible choice. I don't think I'd want to be casting with a fifth of a spell slot, mind you. But it is one I might consider at lower levels and then trade out once I start getting, like, say, you know, third level spells for sure. Uh, the other choice is False Life. It's not that False Life itself is a bad spell, but it is just temporary hit points. And as a Warlock, if you only have, I mean, at level one, you have one spell slot, right? At level two, you have two, and that's going to go up for, you know, half your career or more. It could be the entire campaign, honestly. Uh, do you really want to be using one of your only spell slots to just gain some temporary hit points? Especially when Warlocks have an invocation that allows them to cast False Life at will. Um, I actually think that that's a, a fine invocation at low levels, especially when we're very squishy and death is a very real possibility. Most uh, like TPKs in D&D happen in the first two or three levels, right? Levels level one to three, level one to four, that tends to be the danger zone. But it's way best left to being an invocation and not being used as one of your only spell slots that you have in any given encounter. Uh, level three, we get Blindness, Deafness, and Phantasmal Force. I actually think both these spells are pretty good, especially Blindness, Deafness. Being a debuff that does not require concentration is very rare. It is a constitution saving throw, which is unfortunate. But it also scales fairly well, allowing us to hit additional targets for every spell level beyond two. So, you know, if you can hit three, four targets with one casting the spell, chances are something's going to fail a save. So I actually like them quite a bit. Phantasmal Force isn't bad either, adding, you know, a bit of damage as well, uh, as some, you know, nice effects. Um, it doesn't scale particularly well, though, but it's not a bad spell if we're, like, you know, looking for second-level spell choices. At level 5, we get Phanta or, sorry, Phantom Steed. I almost said Phantasmal Steed, because I still had Phantasmal Force of the brain. Uh, Phantom Steed and Speak with Dead. Uh, Phantom Steed is a spell I absolutely love, but it has uh, one giant problem. The steed takes zero damage, basically, to die, right? It gets hit by anything, it is dead. And once again, that's your only, or, pos or your, one of your only spell slots used on the steed. Now, that doesn't mean it's necessarily a terrible choice, because you could, like, summon the steed, take a short rest, and get that spell slot back again. But in general, uh, I think this is left best to the ritual spellcasters who can do it without using spell slots at all. Um, but, you know, I do like Phantom Steed. Fun spell, it's got crazy movement speed, and, uh, you know, it's pretty nice. Speak with Dead is very circumstantial. I have a really hard time justifying using one of my spells no one on Speak with Dead. Mostly because, you know, it's competing with so many other great spells at third level, like Counterspell and everything else, right? So, it's a situational spell. I'd rather leave it for the cleric if, if the, uh, there's a cleric in the party. 
I'm not saying that it can't be good, especially if you need to do like a murder investigation type campaign, then it can be really, really handy. But overall, again, you've only got a couple spell slots per short rest. I want them to be spells that are going to be very impactful and kind of game changing, not something I'm going to use like maybe once or twice in an entire campaign probably. Uh, so at level 7, we get the options of taking Death Ward and Greater Invisibility. Now these spells are both pretty good. Uh, in fact, I'd say Greater Invisibility is amazing. It's not pretty good, it's excellent. Uh, but Death Ward is a really good spell as well, nothing wrong with that. Especially because of the huge duration on it. You could literally like just cast it on yourself, take a short rest, it's got seven more hours to go, and you haven't even used that spell slot. You could even start casting it on, you know, other people, short rest, get it back, you know. Uh, that's actually not too bad. Hit two people, rest, get the rest of the party, rest. You got all your spell slots back, and everybody's got death ward, you know, in a four person party, anyways. Either way, not a, not a terrible choice by any means, but greater invisibility is just an excellent spell. At level nine, we get anti life shell and cloud kill. And again, anti life shell is one that's very circumstantial. It's not that it's a bad spell per se. I mean, theoretically, you could hold off an infinite number of uh, undead that are too stupid to use missile weapons. <laughs> um, you know, I guess that is something. But again, it's a very situational spell that I've got, especially for a fifth level spell slot, I have a really hard time justifying that. Cloud Kill, on the other hand, I find can be pretty good, especially on classes like Warlocks, actually, where you could be using something like. Um, your, you know, Repelling Blast and Grasp of Vidar and Lance of Lethargy and some of these other type of abilities to push or pull things into the cloud, limit their ability to move out of the cloud. Uh, because it's doing damage every round, you can actually get a lot of mileage out of it, you know, until somebody gusts of winds it away or something. But overall, I actually think Cloud Kill is a pretty good choice. Uh, so moving on to the actual subclass abilities themselves. So at level one, we're going to get Form of Dread. Uh, and this one can actually be used quite a bit. It's our proficiency bonus per long rest. So sure, it's only twice per long rest at low levels, but, you know, scales quite nicely. And scales even beyond Warlock levels, right? It's just based on your proficiency bonus. So if you only took a few levels of Warlock and then, you know, dipped out, uh, it's still going to be scaling, which is nice. It really reminds me a lot of Rage or possibly Wild Shape, but more specifically of Rage. So anyways, it's a bonus action to transform yourself for one minute. You gain temporary hit points equal to one die 10 plus your warlock level uh, once per turn. Uh, if you hit a creature with an attack, then you can choose to try and frighten the creature Then you get a wisdom save. But again, this is a pretty nice ability. And it's just any attack rule, right? You could be using this with a melee attack. You could be using it with a range attack. You could be using it with a spell attack like Elder's Blast, for example. Uh, and you... You also gain immunity to the Frightened condition yourself when you're in your form of Dread. And Frightened is something that comes up quite a bit. So I actually really like this ability. Just being able to, you know, oh, we're fighting a bunch of stuff that could frighten me. Well, I'm just getting my bonus action and transform. And now I don't even have to worry about that. And then I've got all these other benefits on top of that. I actually think this one is a very solid ability. I also like the fact that it works well in like, like, uh, more of a gish build and it also works well in a ranged build so you know i like things that are flexible like that where i can use it either or At level six we get grave touched uh, so we no longer need to eat drink or breathe even though that's more of a ribbon ability it's actually a really good one i mean it's not something that comes up all the time but I've had multiple campaigns where characters have somehow needed to breathe underwater and we didn't have time to like ritually cast water breathing, for example, you know? So that is very, very nice when you don't have to breathe at all. Uh, also one time per turn when hitting with an attack and rolling damage. So, you know, you have to be able to damage the creature. Uh, you can replace the damage type with the necrotic damage type. Uh, this isn't bad, but to be honest, since our main attacks are either going to be probably Elder's Blast, which does force damage, which is much more rarely resisted than Necrotic, 
or we could be doing physical damage, like say slashing, bludgeoning, piercing, whatever, with a weapon. Uh, magical weapons are some of the most reliable damage types in the game. Force is one of the most reliable. Necrotic is uh, not as good, so you know you might want to be careful. Don't just automatically switch damage to necrotic, especially if you're fighting like undead, for example. Uh, however, if you do, you do one extra uh, damage die if using Form of Dread. So I kind of like that. You can turn into your, your Dread form, hit something with an attack, and then change the damage to Necrotic and deal more damage with that attack as well, which is pretty nice. Uh, at level 10, Necrotic Husk. So now just gain resistance to Necrotic damage entirely and immunity to Necrotic damage if we're using our Form of Dread. So again, pretty nice. Uh, also, if reduced to zero hit points, we can use our reaction to stay at one hit point and erupt with death energy, doing uh, two die 10 plus our warlock level in necrotic damage to everything within 30 feet. That includes our allies. We do not get to choose. We just blow up with negative energy and damage everything around us. Uh, this also gives us one level of exhaustion, uh, and we can't use this reaction for one die four long rest. So you still have all the other things like the resistance or even immunity to necrotic damage. You just can't blow up again until you finish one die four long rest, which is probably a good thing after you've hit your allies for a bunch of necrotic damage, they will be grateful that you can't use this ability. Uh, notice though that you can just choose not to use it, right? I mean, even if you reduce to zero, you can be like, yeah, I'll just take one for the team, go down, hope that the cleric can bring me back up again and not damage everybody else around me. Although that is pretty epic and cool. And you never know, like maybe the cleric's just really getting on your nerves and you're like, oops, I blew up everybody at the party. <laughs> Ugh, hilarious. Uh, level 14, we get Spirit Projection. This is a one time per long rest ability. It allows us to project our spirit from our body, leaving it unconscious. Uh, that's probably not quite ideal, but it's kind of like, you know, it's like astral projection. I like it. Um, it lasts one hour, although it could break early if we take damage, like, you know, uh, we have to maintain it as if we were concentrating on a spell. Uh, one of the coolest abilities, though, or coolest effects of this ability is that when it ends, our spirit teleports back to our body, or our body can teleport to where the spirit is, our choice. And um, that makes it a really, really great like scouting an infiltration tool because your spirit can uh, it can go through walls okay so yeah your spirit and body gain resistance to uh, bludgeoning slashing and piercing damage so all the physical damage types conjuration and necromancy spells that we cast no longer have a verbal or somatic component and don't have a material component either unless it has a gold cost attached to it uh, we have a flying speed equal to our movement speed, we can hover, and we can move through solid objects as if it was difficult terrain, but we do take D10 force damage if we end our turn inside an object or a creature, right? Uh, still, like I said, excellent scouting tool. Uh, while using the, uh, the form of the dread, one time per turn, when dealing necrotic damage, we can gain hit points equal to half the damage we dealt, which is also quite nice, gives us some sustainability there. Uh, overall, though, I think it's an excellent ability. Like I said, like I love the idea of being able to like scout a dungeon, you know, uh, just actually project while the rest of the party's guarding your body and just, oh, here's this and here's that. And, oh, there's the big boss. Now I know exactly what the room he's in, you know, and you would just teleport to him if you wanted and ignore the rest of the dungeon, you know. Uh, your 14th level, your party should have teleport somewhere in it by now. And I just think that kind of stuff was kind of cool, or, you know, pass wall, whatever else, right? Uh, you, you can even have etherealness. You're high level party at this point. You have options. That's what I'm trying to say. And uh, yeah, I like that ability. The fact that you can just like end it and just teleport your body to your spirit or your spirit back to your body gives it some really nice uh, flexibility there. So anyways, that covers the abilities. Overall, I think it's a pretty decent subclass. Um, I think the spell list, uh, some of the spells don't scale particularly well, but they are good at the levels we get them, with the exception of False Life, of course. Uh, 
So overall, I think this bell list is decent. I like the form of dread. Um, great touch. Like I said, you know, just being able to pump up the damage if we have to, not needing to eat, drink, or breathe. It's an okay ability. But I feel like the uh, levels 10 and 14 abilities are both pretty good as well. So I feel like one's really strong, six is okay. 10 is pretty good, 14 is pretty good, you know? And so overall, most of the abilities we get are quite strong. Again, um, how many people actually play Warlock the 14th level? That's a different issue. But even if you just wanted to dip in, I think this one gives you some interesting options. I really like the uh, ability to basically rage, more or less, right? Transform into our dread form. And, you know, that's just a cool ability. I like uh, some of the other stuff that goes along with it as well. Like I said, more temporary hit points is okay. Uh, is it quite as good as rage? No. But it's also not bad. <laughs> um, it doesn't really... Like the, the one thing about Rage is that even when you start getting to higher levels and things start hitting a lot harder, Rage just, because it's always reducing the damage by half, it, you know, it's just scaling with how much damage you take. It's always going to be great. Whereas D10 plus your Warlock level is nice, but, you know, it's not quite as good. However, it will protect you against any damage type, right? Whereas unless you're going like with the Totem Warrior, that might not be the case, right? So this will help against fire damage or lightning damage or the cro well, not necrotic. You don't have to worry about that probably by higher levels, right? But, uh, you know, whatever other te psychic, whatever, it doesn't matter, right? Your temporary hit points are just going to absorb any of it. Uh, so I don't mind that. The only thing I will say, though, is that temporary hit points these days are a lot more, you know, easily acquired than they used to be in the past. Now we have things like the Twilight Domain Cleric that can just be giving everybody in the party temporary hit points constantly. Um, artificers can do the same thing depending on your subclass. You know, like there's a, there's a lot of other ways, you know, where it used to be like very, very limited back in the early days of 5th edition. But still, I think it's a very solid ability. I think overall the abilities are pretty good. I like the spell list generally. Like I said, there's a few misses, but that's true of most of them. And, you know, like I said, you're also free to choose stuff from the Warlock spell list, the main spell list. So that's not too bad either. Um, overall, I think it's pretty solid. Do I think it's better than, uh, you know, like say Genie or obviously Hexblade? Probably not. But I do think it's not too far behind. I think it's like in that like solid, you know, upper half of Warlock subclasses. So anyways... Those are my thoughts on the Undead Warlock. Oops, just dropped my notes, but that's okay. Um, my next video is actually going to be in the Warlock Multiclass. And because we're kind of doing Warlocks, we will try to have a lot of Warlock levels in this Multiclass. That's not usually how most Warlock Multiclasses go. You're usually dipping Warlock. But, you know, we've looked at tons of stuff before dipping Warlock. This is going to be more of a Warlock-focused Multiclass. So, anyways... That's what we have for this video. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye.